Good morning, we work. Is it on? I've always had trouble. Have I turned it on? Okay, good. Uh, we welcome you to worship at Hope. Today is the last of the sermons on the commandments, and we're going to learn what it means to covet, and I'm going to tell you, do not covet. If you covet your neighbor's house, his home, his wife, his family, so we're going to start with a hymn that is a prayer for Christian homes. Jesus Christ is all in all, a home that is not holy, he's a sad and poor and dark it is. Oh, bless that house where The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of this forgiveness, let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, preserve the congregation of believers with your never-failing mercy. Help us avoid whatever is wicked and harmful, and guide us in the way that leads to our salvation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. In our reading from Deuteronomy today, Moses gives his last instructions to the children of Israel 
before they go into the land flowing with milk and honey. And he reminds them of the covenant obligation they are under. Because God loves them, they should turn around and obey and follow him. Deuteronomy chapter 30. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away, and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live, and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to him, and hold fast to, his, to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the word of our Lord. We sing Psalm number one that reminds us that God's word is powerful and we are to respect it. Blessed are they who hope children up at this time to sit in the front row over here. And during this time, you might fill out the uh, registration of being in attendance. You don't have to fill in all the information every Sunday, but give it to us if it changes. What is tomorrow? Labor Day. Labor Day, when I was a child, always meant school was going to start. Some of you maybe remember that too. School always started Tuesday after Labor Day. Will you be starting school this week? How long have you been going to school? Well, well you must have learned a lot of words. You know, 
In first grade, you learn these real short words like run and jump and see and the. You know, that's the word people say more than anything else. The. And if you see the, can you read it? Spell it. Okay. I want to teach you a new word today. Because, you know, as you grow older and the grades you go up, you get bigger and, and bigger words till you get thoughtfulness and, and nevertheless and things like that. But I'm going to give you a five-letter word, real simple. Covet. That's a hard word to define. Covet. Well, the ninth commandment says you shall not covet your neighbor's house. The tenth commandment says you shall not covet your neighbor's other things. Covet must be a serious thing. God gave us two commandments. Do not covet. Coveting is a desire for something. Well, it's not bad to, to desire something. <laughs> Last Sunday morning, I desired a new battery. My car wouldn't start. I had to take Pastor Henning's car over to Prescott. But I don't covet a new battery because I have a new battery. But I might look around and see. You know, some people have beautiful white hair. You know, mine still has some of these brown streaks in it. And, and I might covet their, oh, I would really want that. See, coveting is really wanting it so bad that it's wrong. So to covet is always a sinful desire. The Apostle Paul, you know he was raised as a Pharisee? And these Pharisees really liked the law. They were going to keep the law all the way. And before Paul became a Christian, he thought he kept all the law. But he wrote, I would not have known what sin was except the law had said, you shall not covet. Well, he never stole. He honored his father and mother. He, he didn't lie. So he thought he kept all the commandments. And now he finds the ninth and tenth commandments, do not covet. Now, all of a sudden, he realized that he was a sinner. All this time, he thought he was a pretty good guy. Now he realizes he's coveting because he thinks about all the things he wants. You know, when, when I go over to church in Prescott and I drive up that nice windy road, there's a big three-story blue house. It's a mansion. But I don't covet that because I couldn't live in all those rooms. I got a nice little apartment, so I'm satisfied. If you're satisfied, you don't covet. But it's when you are unhappy, and you want more, and you want more. And that's the way I define covet. When you want more and more and more and more and more, and you're never done. Be satisfied with what you have. Do not covet. Thank you for coming up. Let's join in the verse of the day. The gospel reading from Luke 14. Do not covet. The Lord Jesus warns us not to covet anything. Because if anything is in your life ahead of God, you shall have no other gods. If anything is in your life is ahead of Jesus, it's a sin. So he is saying, you know, when I tell you not to covet, that's going to cause some trouble. Look at the trouble that comes when we are told to put Christ first. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, 
If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go out to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It's thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, I hope you catch on. Hating father and mother is not what you're being told to do. You are being told to put nothing ahead of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Jesus is warning us to stand up to the idols of our times. Please be seated. As we sing the next hymn, we're going to sing verse 1 and then verse 13 that tells us not to covet. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours through the Lord Jesus Christ, whom we put first in our lives. Our text today that bids us not to covet is recorded in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin 
and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. The word of our Lord. You shall not covet. The new catechism that came out in 2019 has a good definition of to covet. To covet means to have a sinful desire or craving in our hearts for something God has not given us. Now that's the quote. A sinful desire for something God does not want us to have. Now, I desire a lot of things. I desire a good meal. I desire a house to sleep in. I desire a car that always starts and gets me to where I'm going. So there are lots of desires I have. And when Blue Bell ice cream's on sale, I desire to buy two half gallons every time. You know that Texas ice cream is the only one that still has two quarts instead of one and a half quarts? But there are sinful desires that go beyond craving. See, even craving is not always a sin. I think if I were pregnant, I would crave ice cream. I don't know what you women crave, but they talk about craving certain things. My wife, she craved cornflakes. Just plain, not sugared, just plain cornflakes. So having a desire is not wrong. Even craving things isn't wrong. And you can look at people and say, hey, they've got things I would like, and I envy them. I used to think that envy was always sin. But envy might be just a way of saying, you know, I admire what you have, or I respect you for what you have. But we have to be careful it doesn't become a jealous envy that wants to take your house, that wants to take your spouse, that wants to take your servants and workers, wants to take away your dog or your cat. So coveting is a definition that it's always sin. And that's how the Apostle Paul learned to appreciate that sin is in the heart. That even coveting is wrong. Now, I have a hunch it's dissatisfaction, not being content, that leads people to covet. James writes it this way. Where do conflicts and quarrels and fighting come from? Don't they come from your cravings for pleasure? You desire something but cannot obtain it. So you quarrel and fight. I think it's that discontent that somebody else has something that leads to quarrels. They argue about whose it is and whose turn it is. Or, or they, they're not satisfied that you got picked almost last for your football team. And on the playgrounds, that leads to a feeling of jealousy. And then, it's very easy, isn't it, to start an argument, to start a fight. But it isn't limited to the school schoolroom or the classroom. It's that way in the world, too. You see someone else getting ahead, and you want to push them aside. You're almost ready to start a fight to get what you want so badly. But the Apostle Paul says, don't put that desire for earthly things so high that they become idols. And we have to stand up against the modern idols of America today. So Paul wrote to Timothy. He said that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. And he also wrote, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and many foolish and harmful desires which plumb them into destruction and utter ruin. 
See, that's a pretty strong warning. That when you want something so bad that it takes over your life, when the things that Jesus mentioned, even parents or family or loved ones are more important than Christ, you can fall from the faith. It doesn't say that it's wrong to want to be rich. I think ambition is a good thing. You should have ambition. You should want to get ahead. You should want good grades in school. You should want to win the game when you're playing a game. You should want those things, but they should not take over your life. They should not become sinful wishing, sinful desires, which is to covet. And so the Lord gave two commandments. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. And Martin Luther explains, what does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house, nor obtain it by a show of right to take him to court and lie about it, but help and be of service to him in keeping it. And you shall not covet your neighbor's spouse. You know, I kind of like that translation. Instead of you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. <laughs> because women shouldn't covet somebody else's husband either. You shall not covet your neighbor's spouse, nor his workers, nor his animals, nor anything else that is your neighbor's. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not seek to entice or take away from our neighbor his spouse, his workers, or his cat or dog, Luther only said animals, but rather urge them to stay and do their duty. Now, you notice there are two commandments that are almost the same. You shall not covet. The Eastern Orthodox Church, the church in Greece and, and what we know today as the Orthodox churches, they put those together as one commandment. Well, then how could they come up with ten well, what they did was to take the first commandment that we have and split it into two. You shall have no other gods. You shall not make unto yourself any graven images. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You shall remember the Sabbath day. Honor your father and mother. And you see what they have? The fifth commandment is you shall, not, you shall, not, you shall honor your father and mother. Now, what seems to happen is most of the radio and television programs seem to be influenced by the Reformed Church, which has taken their numbering from the Eastern Church. In fact, some of the Reformers, they did their best to get away from anything that looked like it was Roman Catholic. And for 1,500 years, the Western Church and the Roman Catholic Church counted the ten sayings the same way we count them. So the fourth commandment is honor your father and your mother. Martin Luther saw no reason to change the numbering that was used for 1,500 years. And, and by the way, Exodus and, the, and Deuteronomy don't call these ten commandments. If you look real closely, most Bibles will tell you there are ten sayings. Commonly, they're referred to as the Decalogue. Hey, hey, there's, there's a new vo word for your vocabulary to go with covet. The Decalogue. Deca, decimal, you know, deca, ten. Logos, Decalogue, ten words, ten sayings. Now, the Hebrew rabbis had a different way to put covet together and come up with another saying. They used, and I like this, the Hebrews had a good idea here, saying number one, I am the Lord your God that delivered you out of slavery in Egypt. Therefore, you shall have no other gods before me. You see why that makes sense? Before God tells the people to obey his laws and commands and in degrees and judgments and statutes, 
Realize that he's the God of grace and mercy. He brought you out of slavery. And so Martin Luther says, you too should love the Lord who redeemed you, who saved you, and gave you everlasting life. And so you should walk in these ten sayings. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in Bible class because I come up with 17 sayings. Godliness with contentment is great gain. When I was a child, I thought godliness means you're supposed to act like God. And that's not a bad definition. But I like the ancient Greek definition of what we translate as godliness, oizabaya. So if you want to put a Greek word in your vocabulary, it's oizabaya. The Greeks considered oizabaya the very highest kind of morality the greatest form of pietism, the best way that you can live to please Zeus and Jupiter and Diana. You please the gods by being Oizabaya. I like to use a Christian definition there. Oizabaya is the proper relationship to my God. I will fear, love, and trust in God above all things. That's always the bio. Now, if you have that kind of faith in your heart and you add to it contentment, godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, again, the Greek has a beautiful way of describing contentment. Contentment is I am self-filled. Contentment. I'm self-filled. I have all I need. My God has given me whatever he wants me to have to carry out my purposes in life. And so I am content where I am. And I've got to tell you that my contentment comes greatly when I go into someone's home and give them private communion. Or when I can, when I can stand, by the, in the, stand in the pulpit and actually say, your sins are forgiven. Jesus is your Savior. And that is a contentment that really makes me satisfied. Having food and drink, clothing and shoes, we will be satisfied. I like to define satisfied too. I like these definitions because they explain the Bible a little bit more. Being satisfied is like the 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me. My cup runneth over. I'm fully satisfied, because in my life my, my cup is, is running over. It's all these things that are running over because my God has blessed me me. Now the Apostle Paul also wrote, and when he wrote this in prison, I have learned the secret of being content in every, in every situation. Would you like to know Paul's secret of contentment? His secret of contentment was to realize I am where God put me, I'm just as tall as God wanted me to be. I have talents to do whatever God expected of me. And so I am content. But the real bottom line, the necessary contentment, is what Jesus talked about in the gospel. And Paul expressed it, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. In Christ, I'm content. In Christ, I have everything I need. But you know, we ought to stand with the Apostle Paul and realize how serious a sin in the heart is. Coveting, a sin in the heart. Whenever we look at these ten sayings, 
Okay, I'll call them Ten Commandments. They accuse us of being sinners. And these ten sayings, these ten commandments aren't what get us to heaven. It's the fact that the Lord our God has delivered us from slavery to our sins. And so we'll say with Paul, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we are freely justified through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ who redeemed us by his death on the cross. Sinner, but saved. And so let's beware of making idols of the things of this world. And let's realize that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join in confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please stand for prayer. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. You have filled our hearts with contentment. You have made us satisfied having the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior from sin and the one who has opened heaven to us. Holy Spirit,
Thank you for sending faithful men to serve as pastors in the congregations of our synod. Guide these shepherds of your church as they study your word and keep them faithful to the truths revealed in Holy Scripture. Give us a pastor to fill our vacancy. Be with the pastor we have called and invite him to come from Alaska to come and join us here in Arizona. And let them preach and teach the good news about Jesus the Savior. We also ask that you would be with our Sunday school teachers and Bible class teachers who start next week and will be in inducted into their offices. We thank you for giving your church ministerial education, schools that prepare your people for public ministry, local Sunday schools, area congregations, preparatory schools, and a ministerial college and seminary where young men and women are trained to serve in your kingdom. We pray that you will bless the students who study, that they be eager to learn, willing to serve, and motivated by your gospel to keep your commandments and to share your word with others. We thank you for giving us the opportunity yesterday to reach out to people who are unchurched, that we were able to invite at least 18 people to come and study what we would share with them. We thank you for the volunteers that helped out yesterday in the booth that we had at the, at the park. And we pray that as they hear the word and consider the word, the Holy Spirit will lead them to faith. We also pray for unbelievers around the world that the gospel ministry may not be bound, but that the Lord Jesus Christ may become first in everyone's life, even above their family, even above their material things, so that they will also count the cost of following Jesus. Because Jesus says there's no room for idols in our lives, but he comes first. These and all things we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is. Give us today the daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as we prepare to observe the sacrament of the altar, to receive the true body and blood of our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. By the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, he empowered his church to be witnesses of Christ to the ends of the earth. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, 
which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Take and eat. This is the true body of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given it to death on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Lord Jesus. Shed.
O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people that have worshipped here and have received the sacrament of the altar. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. Bestow on us your saving peace and give us the strength in Jesus to stand against the idols of our times. For Jesus lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace.